Howdy there, everybody. We're back with dinosaurs. Ever since I was little, I've loved everything dinosaur related. Grimlock was my favorite Transformer, Land Before Time was my favorite series at one point, and Ixalan is by far my favorite plane. A place of great jungle, temples, pirates, merfolk, vampiric conquistadors. And did I mention the dinosaurs? Because it's got those two. And Blazing Like the Dawn is one of the mightiest. Gishath. Sun's Avatar. Supporting my three favorite colors from Magic, Gishath is an 8 mana 7 6 with Vigilance, Trample, and Haste. And as scary as that is already, it gets even better with its ability. Whenever Gishath deals combat damage to a player, reveal that many cards from the top of your library. Put any number of dinosaur creature cards from among them onto the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of your library. Now running out right after cast and trampling over an opponent's blockers, only to get even more bodies, is pretty sweet. Especially when we look at the things coming out of the jungle to say hello. Starting with this deck's Timmy Top 3. As a short reminder, the Timmy Top 3 are my favorite creatures from each deck, excluding my commander. Things are about to get angry, starting with Apex Altasaur. This big guy is probably the most aggressive herbivore in this deck and isn't afraid to take it outside. For 7 generic and 2 green, we get a 10-10 body that fights up to one target creature on entry. But plot twist, because after that fight is over, Apex Altasaur's Enrage ability kicks in, and it's ready to go another round. This thing can and will fight itself to death if you let it. My next two top three picks are a couple of Clever Girls, Polyraptor, and Ripjaw Raptor. And besides being gorgeous to look at, Polyraptor creates copies of itself whenever it's dealt damage, and those copies come loaded with that same ability, so the fun can be exponential. Biting off the other hand is Ripjaw Raptor, helping us pull what we need from our deck by drawing us a card whenever it's dealt damage. Both of these pretty ladies bring great effects to our board and provide solid toughness to let us provoke their rage without worrying about them kicking the bucket. Among dinosaurs of Ixalan, there are still yet those more ferocious and ancient. Pay tribute to the elder dinosaurs, nature incarnate, starting with Itali, Primal Storm, and hug your Bibles, folks, because this thing is unholy. A 6-mana six 6-6, six, six, whenever Itali attacks, the top card of each player's library goes to exile, and then we may cast any non-land cards exiled this way without paying their mana costs. The storm rages, and the earth breaks. Next, Zatalpa, Primal Dawn, rises with flying, double strike, vigilance, trample, and indestructible. Eight damage never looked so terrifying. The sky takes flight, and the earth trembles. It doesn't tremble for long, though, because Galta, Primal Hunger, strides confidently in with a 12-12 body that costs 12 mana. But Galta costs X less to cast, where X is the total power of creatures we control. So get ready to cast this guy for double green. The Earth Walks, strongest of all. Finally, the last of the Elder Dinosaurs, a force so ancient and fearsome it bears the name Primal Calamity. Zakama acts as an alternate commander to this deck, and besides his two extra heads, he also brings Vigilance, Trample, and Reach. He also untaps all of our lands once he enters if he was successfully cast. The three abilities aren't bad either, each head having a different ability for three mana and representing a color. Red deals three damage to target creature, green demolishes an artifact or enchantment, and white gains us three life. Needless to say, nature's pissed. I bet you thought you were safe, didn't you? You thought there was no way I'd get this far in without mentioning it, right? Well, too bad. Gigantosaurus is my childhood fantasy in a card. A huge green carnivorous monster. Seven-year-old me wouldn't even hesitate. I would have been eaten for sure. But regardless, and anyway, this thing is my favorite turn five surprise if I find myself with too much green mana. Moving right along, we take off with Sky Terror, a 2-2 with flying and menace, followed closely by Majestic Helioptorus, another 2-2 that can carry another target attacking dinosaur across enemy lines by giving it flying. And our last of our winged warriors is Kinjali's Sunwing, a nice prehistoric way to force your opponent's creatures to enter the battlefield tapped. I prefer to keep my feet firmly on the ground, however, in the lush, dense safety of the jungle, where even the hatchlings of Ixalan come to the fray. Needletooth Raptor deals 5 damage to target creature and opponent controls on enrage, while Cherished Hatchling serves a higher purpose. When it dies, we may cast dinosaur spells this turn as though they had flash, and whenever we cast a dinosaur creature spell this turn, it gains when this creature enters the battlefield, you may have it fight another target creature. Love the baby, respect the baby. Far away from the nesting grounds live the aspects of the sun themselves, representing Tilonali, Kinjali, and Ixali, respectively. We have the three other sun's avatars. Burning Sun's Avatar deals 3 damage to target opponent and 3 damage to up to 1 target creature on entry. Wakening Sun's Avatar wipes the battlefield of all non-dinosaur creatures if we cast it from our hand. And last but not least, Verdant Sun's Avatar gains us life equal to a creature's toughness when it enters the battlefield, counting itself. Next, we've got a couple of creatures back again from my last video, Rampaging Brontodon and Wayward Swordtooth, both more at home here on Ixalan and doing their land-based fun. Moving right along, we've got some hardcore herbivores with Seachorn Ceratops, Charging Tuscadon, and Goring Ceratops, bringing two, three, and even more horns to the party. Starting with Seachorn, there is no such thing as a dead end, and this big boy gets two 1-1 one -one counters as long as he survives being enraged. Charging Tuscadon is a solid 4-4 body with Trample, and if it would deal combat damage to a player, go ahead and double that damage, pal. 
In keeping with that theme, Goring Ceratops has double strike, and whenever it attacks, other creatures we control gain double strike until end of turn. They don't even have to be attacking. Is that useless? Yes. Do I like it? Also yes. Coming up from the undergrowth is Death Gorge Scavenger. Whenever this guy enters the battlefield or attacks, you may exile target creature card in any graveyard and get one of two effects. If we exile a creature card this way, we gain two life. A non-creature card gives Death Gorge Scavenger plus one plus one until end of turn. Next is the utility knife of dinosaurs, Shifting Ceratops. This guy can't be countered, has protection from blue, and for one green, it gets dealer's choice of reach, trample, or haste until end of turn. Pulled across plains from Mycoria, we have Titanoth Rex, an 11-11 body with trample and cycling, and when we cycle it, we get to put a trample counter on a creature we control. Huge respect to Svetlin Velenov for daring to ask if Dinosaur and Kodiak Bear mixed. Cheers, my dude. Our other beautiful Ikorian hybrid is Quartzwood Crasher. This behooved behemoth is a 6-6 with Trample that brings some serious board presence with its ability. See, whenever one or more creatures we control with Trample deals combat damage to a player, we create an XX Green Dino Beast creature token with Trample, where X is the amount of damage those creatures dealt to that player. Woo, that's one hell of a stampede. Speaking of stampedes, back on Ixalan, Thundering Spineback rallies our forces with a plus one plus one buff, and if we have more mana than we know what to do with, we can spend five and a green to create a 3-3 three, three green dinosaur creature token with Trample. Another dinosaur with a group mentality, Regisaur Alpha gives our other dinosaurs haste, and when it enters, it brings a 3-3 three, three dino token with it. As part of the pack, we have Raging Regisaur and Raging Swordtooth. These two angry boys both express themselves in slightly different ways, Raging Regisaur deals 1 damage to target creature or player on attack, while Raging Swordtooth deals 1 damage to each other creature on entry. Now if you've got that one friend who just loves to burn your creatures, or that other friend like me who loves the fight mechanic, then you'll understand why I run Temple Altasaur. If any source would deal damage to another dino we control, prevent all but one of that damage. This also works really well for enrage effects, which now that I think about it, is probably the intention. Another good way to protect your dinos is to remove the opposition from the equation altogether with Trapjaw Tyrant. Its unique enrage ability effect exiles a creature until someone takes out the tyrant itself. A couple of red creatures are coming up starting with Marauding Raptor. Not only does it make creature spells we cast cost one less to cast, but whenever another creature enters the battlefield under our control, our raptor sicks it for two damage. And if that creature was a dinosaur, the raptor gets a plus two plus zero buff until end of turn. And one of the enrage effects we can trigger this way is Silverclad Ferocidons, which makes our opponent sacrifice a permanent. And with an 8-5 body, it's no joke either. Our last two dinosaurs may be on opposite ends of the food chain, but they're definitely on the same page with helping us. Runic Armosaur and Ranging Raptors. Runic Armosaur draws us a card whenever an opponent activates a creature or land ability that isn't a mana ability, while the raptors help us get basic lands from our library on Enrage. The mighty Sun Empire of Ixalan lives alongside the dinosaurs, using the power of the immortal sun to control them when necessary. And among these humans are a select few that we've chosen to shepherd our forces. Starting with Atla Polani, Nest Tender. The third and final alternate commander for this deck, she costs one, a red, green, and white, and for two generic mana, we can tap her to create a 0-1 green egg creature token with Defender. Secondly, whenever an egg we control dies, we reveal the top cards of our library until we reveal a creature card and put it right onto the battlefield. Then, we shuffle the stack of exile cards and put them onto the bottom. This allows for a better early game presence, and the ability to create blockers that no one wants to kill acts as great deterrent for your more aggressive opponents. Our next few tiny humans help our mana curve with Drover of the Mighty, who taps for one mana of any color, and if we control a dinosaur, he gets a plus two plus two buff, while that Sotskin Seer also taps for one mana of any color, but additionally, we can sacrifice him to return a dinosaur card from our graveyard to our hand. The next trio will all help reduce the casting cost of our dinosaurs, Knight of the Stamp Peed, representing green and reducing the generic cost by two, Kinjali's Collar, representing white and reducing the generic cost by one, and last of the three, Otepec Huntmaster, representing red in more than one way. Not only does he reduce the generic cost by one, but we can also tap him to give target dinosaur haste until end of turn. What's a tribal deck without a creature tutor, you might ask? Well, it's not as fun as one with one, and it's definitely not as fun as one with two. First, Forerunner of the Empire is here to save the day. I don't know why they didn't print this card at rare for what it does, because not only do we get to tutor for a dinosaur creature card and put it on top of our deck, but whenever a dinosaur enters the battlefield under our control, we can have our Forerunner poke it for one damage. That's super useful for enrage effects, and including the option to poke or not is really powerful. Priest of the Wakening Sun, on the other hand, requires that we pay three double white and sacrifice it to tutor for a dino directly into our hand. More useful until then is its first ability, which triggers at the beginning of our upkeep and allows us to reveal a dinosaur creature card from our hand. And if we do, we gain two life. 
I'm sure my friends love seeing my cherished hatchling for the fifth time in a row. Our last human isn't a creature card at all, but the warrior poet herself, Huatli. Huatli Radiant Champion, to be specific. She's a Planeswalker card that costs two, one white, and one green, and comes in with three loyalty counters. The plus one gives her a loyalty counter for each creature we control, so we can alter on our next turn with the right board to get her emblem for minus eight, which lets us draw a card whenever a creature enters the battlefield under our control. After that, we can use her minus one to our heart's content to give target creature plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creatures we control. Coming up next, we have a couple of the mightiest gods in Theros, Xenagos, god of revels, and Iroas, god of victory. Both are indestructible and aren't creatures unless our devotion to their respective colors is less than seven, but both have great synergy on the battlefield, starting with Xenagos, who at the beginning of our combat gives another target creature we control plus X plus X until end of turn where X is its power. Iroas, besides being the god of come at me bro, gives our creatures menace and prevents all damage that would be dealt to attacking the creatures we control. First victory, then the revel. But what are gods without monuments? And by monuments, I mean artifacts. Of course, we have a soul ring that's an automatic include, so let's look at some other rocks, like Obelisk of Naya and Celestia Signet for starters, for that very rare soul ring signet turn one, and Fountain of Icker to tap for any one color. Using the Fountain's second ability, we can also animate it for three mana for a 3-3 dinosaur artifact creature until end of turn. Our next two artifacts have a lot of excellent flavor. First, Thalmatic Compass helps us seek out basic lands by paying three generic and tapping it, and at the beginning of our upkeep, if we control seven or more lands, we transform it into Spires of Orozka, a land that can tap for one colorless or tap to remove a target attacking creature an opponent controls from combat. Have fun getting lost in the jungle, Blightsteel Colossus, you monster you. Speaking of getting lost in the jungle, Dowsing Dagger gives us a target opponent two zero two plant tokens. On the upside though, it's an equipment that gives the equipped creature plus two plus one, and when that creature deals combat damage to any player, we transform it into Lost Veil, a pretty powerful land that can tap for three of any one color. Returning for some more excellent flavor is Growing Rites of Itlamok. And I didn't go into this card before, but it's really good. For only two and a green, you get a legendary enchantment that has when this card enters the battlefield, look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal a creature card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom in any order. Then, at the beginning of your end step, if we control four or more creatures, we transform it into Itlamok Cradle of the Sun, which is essentially Better Gaia's Cradle, tapping for either one green or one green for each creature you control. This isn't the only enchantment in our arsenal, though. Mirari's Wake is a five mana green and white enchantment that gives our creatures plus one plus one, and whenever we tap a land for mana, we add one extra mana of any type that land produced. Our last enchantment is the only aura in this deck, with Tilanali's Crown. Not only does the enchanted creature get plus three plus zero and trample, but the enchantment deals one damage to that creature on entry, so prepare for a pissed off attacker. Speaking of ways to aggravate our unlikely allies, we have a trio of red spells, starting with my favorite, Reckless Rage. For one red mana, this red spell deals four damage to target creature we don't control and two damage to target creature we do. Ryle is another useful spell, dealing one damage to a creature we control, giving it trample, and drawing us a card, all for one red as well. Sakama makes another appearance with Shake the Foundation, for three mana, this card deals one damage to each creature without flying and draws us a card. Our next two spells represent all three colors with Titanic Ultimatum and Naya Charm. Titanic Ultimatum is a great game-ending spell if it doesn't get countered. For two red, three green, and two white mana, our creatures get plus five, plus five, and a deadly fun combination of First Strike, Lifelink, and Trample. Naya Charm is a little bit more affordable, costing only one of each of our colors, and gives us one of three options. It can deal three damage to target creature, return a card from a graveyard to its owner's hand, or tap all creatures target player controls. Bless the Nyan gods. Finishing out our arsenal of non-creature spells is Decimate. That's right, red and green gives me an excuse to destroy four targets for four mana. I've gotta let the inner spike out every now and then, the poor guy needs some air. Bringing things to a close, we'll go into our non-basic lands, starting with Command Tower, Rupture Spire, and Path of Ancestry. All three tap for any of our colors, but Path of Ancestry lets us scry one if we use that mana to cast a dinosaur, or in the rare event I use Atla Pulani when we cast a human. Opal Palace is another good option for color filtering, and if we use its filter ability to cast our commander, it enters with a plus one plus one counter for each time it's been cast from the command zone. Hooray commander decks? Coming up last, we have the Land Lightning Round, with Temple of the False God to help us ramp as long as we have five lands. Naya Panorama, Evolving Wilds, Terramorphic Expanse, and Myriad Landscape all help us grab the lands we're looking for from our library. Thriving Heath, Grove, and Bluff help us further correct our color spread. Inspiring Vantage is useful early game, and Temple of Abandon, Triumph, and Plenty all let us scry one on entry. 
Finally, our last non-basic land is Bonder's Enclave. If we control a creature with power 4 or greater, which we will, we get to pay 3 and tap it to draw a card. And with all that, this episode of Timmy Time is coming to a close. I need to welcome the new subscribers to my channel from Reddit. Thank you all for helping me feel motivated to continue to make these videos and keep the feedback coming. It really means a lot. Anyway, I'll include an MTG Goldfish link to the full deck list in the description. And if you like this video and you aren't subscribed, go ahead and click that button to legally become a French fry. Thank you all, and I'll see you in the next one. Q preview. Let no joyful voice be heard. Let no man look up at the sky with hope. Ah! And let this day be cast by we who ready to wait. Ah! The Kraken!